Give and grow rich. Christian success. Bible prosperity. It's the latest teaching to spread like wildfire through religious circles. A popular idea today is that God wants His people to be prosperous. Poverty simply demonstrates a lack of belief. With the right faith, you can just name it and claim it. Anything can be yours, and giving to the appropriate causes, we're told, will ensure that the financial rewards keep rolling in. It is written. This is George Vanderman presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. Today, the religion of Get. A new religion has appeared on the horizon, the religion of prosperity. It focuses on getting and giving in order to get. The new message attracts many hearers we all wouldn't mind getting a piece of that wonderful Christian prosperity. The religion of get has its glowing testimonials. People talk about how financial disaster turned into financial abundance as soon as they learned how to claim certain promises. They discuss their wonderful blessings, late model cars, new homes in the suburbs. Prosperity has become the new religious watchword. Seems to be the new measure of spirituality, too. Christian bestsellers shower us with guaranteed formulas for success. Believe and receive. Give and grow rich. Name it and claim it, I said. Stretch your faith and expand your bank account. Well, some, unfortunately, in television ministries have been among the foremost advocates of the religion of prosperity. Make your donations, some say, God will take care of all your financial problems. Give and prosperity is guaranteed. Well, let's take a good look at this new turn of events. Now, some of you may be saying, wait a minute, Pastor Vanderman. Didn't Jesus say, give and you shall receive? Isn't it true that God wants to bless his children? Isn't the idea of prosperity based on biblical promises? Yes, yes, God did make that promise about giving and receiving. And yes, God does want to bless us. But the question is, receive what? Bless us with what? I'm afraid that when material prosperity becomes a focal point of our religion, then the gospel is distorted. Let's look at one of the Bible promises that's sometimes used to guarantee material abundance. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Matthew 6, 33, said, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, what does all these things refer to? If you look back through chapter 6, you'll find that Jesus was urging his listeners not to worry about food and clothing. Our Heavenly Father, Jesus pointed out, can meet our basic needs, just as he feeds the birds of the air and clothes the lilies of the field. All these things refers to daily necessities, food, shelter, clothing. But I seriously doubt that it includes a new yacht or extra TVs for each of the bedrooms. Now, it's true that God blesses us when we seek his kingdom first, but the blessing promised is this. Our needs are met. It's true that scripture promises abundance to those who give, but abundance in the Bible has a much broader meaning than simply lots of money. The genuinely abundant life centers around loving relationships, meaningful work, and a happy home. It also includes sacrifice on occasion. And yes, it may include material prosperity. God may choose to bless some in that way. There are people who have a gift for using finances wisely to help others. I know of godly men and women whom God has called to work for him through their prosperity. Riches can be a blessing, but so can the lack of riches. There's a calling to the simple life, too. There's profit in that, you see. Jesus himself found that even poverty suited his purposes quite well. Plainly, we're not all called to be rich. 
We're not all called to seek more prosperity so that we can give more. For one thing, it usually doesn't work out that way. The plain facts are simply these. Wealth rarely inspires generosity. Recently, two churches decided to sponsor refugee families. One was quite affluent, but its members found fundraising very difficult. They had to resort to fried chicken suppers and car washes to raise the necessary money. The other church had very little of what is called prosperity. But they didn't have to put on any fundraising events. The members were simply told of the need, and everyone gave. The necessary funds were soon in hand. The Apostle Paul had a similar experience with certain Macedonian churches. They were asked to take up a collection for believers in Judea. And here's what the Apostle Paul reported, found in 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter and the 2nd verse, with the New International Version. Look, but of the most severe trial, out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. In their poverty, the Macedonians were generous. That made them seem rich. Prosperity, on the other hand, too often stifles our best impulses. As one Christian businessman consulted, consultant put it, affluent people are often the hardest to motivate. Get rich to give more? I'm afraid the religion of get just doesn't work out very well. It also distorts the gospel. When all our focus is on prosperity, generating more funds, we imply that God desperately needs big bucks. We begin to think that money is the key ingredient in the forward march of God's cause. But the fact is that material means don't of themselves produce spiritual results. It's only the Spirit of God that bears spiritual fruit. The prophet Zechariah was once faced with the formidable task of helping rebuild Jerusalem's temple. The city was in ruin. The Hebrew people, having just returned from exiles in Babylon, had few resources. But God encouraged Zechariah with these words, fourth chapter, sixth verse, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. By my Spirit. How easy it is to forget those words, those powerful words. In our rush to build these huge auditoriums and vast evangelism complexes, in our race after the latest technology, we forget that without God's Spirit, not much happens. Without His activity, we see no results. Several hundred years after Zechariah helped complete the temple, Jesus sat in that very courtyard. He watched wealthy donors come and pour bags of silver and gold into the temple treasury. They made a great show of their generosity. But then an impoverished widow approached she meekly slipped two small copper coins into the box. And Jesus astonished his disciples and everyone else by commenting. Luke 21, verse 3 says, This poor widow has put, it, put in more than all the others. The widow's gift, you see, was a sacrifice flowing from a devoted heart. It counted more in God's eyes than all the gold of the rich who selfishly donated out of their abundance. That's why those two copper coins could accomplish more. There's no limit to the usefulness of a gift given by God's Spirit. I tell you, friend, God needs generous hearts. His plans don't depend on Christians becoming rich. They depend on the richness of our Christianity. Perhaps the greatest danger in the religion of get, though, is what it does to our hearts. When the purpose of giving becomes getting, we're in trouble. We've slipped into the acquisition trap. Our values shrink into a desire for material things. Paul pointed out how important motivation is in giving. In his famous love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, he observes, verse 3, he said, If I give all I possess to the poor, but have not love, I gain nothing. Then a few verses later, Paul informs us that love is not self-seeking. Listen, if we're giving to get, we're not giving in love. We gain nothing. 
God's kind of abundance will elude us. But giving in love, selfless giving, can be a powerful weapon in our hands. We can wield it to break the hold of materialism on our lives. True giving stifles the old love of money. That's the, such a danger to our souls. How desperately we need the weapon of selfless giving today. Because we live in a world of get, get, and more get. The new buzzword for the upwardly mobile is lifestyle. We must maintain a, maintain a certain lifestyle that reflects our income. Purchase the right house, pursue the right hobbies, shop at the right stores, and advertising has all but made a religion out of prosperity. Television commercials, commercials preach the virtue of rewarding yourself. Go right ahead, we're told. Reward yourself with that high-tech stereo. Those several hundred dollar shoes, you deserve it. The voices of get are everywhere. Their appeal never ceases. There's always more to buy, always a better brand and newer model, a step up in style. State lotteries have become celebrated media events. Everyone, it seems, wants a piece of the more action, a shot at their dreams, a chance at the big spin. When the time approaches for the one lucky number to be drawn, the drums roll and they bring millions to reverend silence. Everyone rallies to the loud trumpet call of get. The sound of prosperity has a winning ring to it. In other words, money talks. I know, I hear it all the time. Let me share something very personal with you. In our television ministry, we must continually struggle to keep finances from being the big issue. You probably know there are tremendous costs in producing a program for television. The purchase of airtime on stations throughout North America requires a continual, breathtaking investment. Of course, I believe it's an exciting and an excellent investment. The potential of television is awesome. We can reach millions with the good news. But the demand on our resources are great. And so we must do our best to be in to be good stewards of what God has given to us. We have to determine how much advertising will be the most effective, what stations will give us the most coverage for our investment. We have to keep in regular contact with our supporters to tell them of our needs. In all of this, there's the danger that money will become all too important. Finances seem to dictate so many decisions. How easily we can forget these Things happen only by God's Spirit. When our needs are so great, it's a temptation to slip into the religion of get. But we must never allow the material to swallow up the spiritual. And I pray continually, and you pray for me, that God's will, not just finance, will direct every step of this ministry. All of us, in one way or another, face the pressures of get. And all of us desperately need God's weapon of selfless giving. It's our only way to fight against the tyranny of money. Let me illustrate. A representative from the British Missionary Society was paying his regular visit to a shipping magnate. This businessman was a generous and regular donor. After chatting with the representative for a few moments, he wrote out a check worth $250. But just then he was handed a cablegram. It contained some very bad news. One of his ships carrying a valuable cargo had been lost at sea. The businessman stared at the message for a moment and then said, of course I'll have to rewrite that check. Well, the representative understood and handed back the check. His, then, his friend then proceeded to write out a check worth six times more than the previous amount. The representative was about to thank him and leave when he, he glanced at the amount. Oh, he said, you must have made a mistake. No, he didn't, the other man replied. That cablegram was from my heavenly father. It said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. That remarkable businessman used giving to break the hold of money on his heart. When he was feeling the loss of all his shipping revenue, just when the pull to save and to get was strongest, 
He chose to wield the weapon of giving. He made sure his treasures were safely in heaven. By the way, this message, word for word, will be found in the gift offer at the close of the telecast today. We'll tell you how you may have it. We'll send it to your home without any cost, so ask for it, won't you? Giving in itself is a blessing. It is an end in itself. It enlarges our hearts and strengthens our values. Selfless giving doesn't wait around for divine kickback. It goes on to meet other needs. Paul urges us in 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter and the 7th verse, but just as you excel in everything, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. The grace of giving. I like that, don't you? Watchman Nee was one gifted man who excelled in the grace of giving. While serving in the city of Fu Chao, this young Chinese minister received an invitation to address a series of weekend meetings in Chen O. That town laid 150 miles upriver. The fare by motorboat would cost at least $80 and Lee had only $30 in hand. But he felt sure his expenses would be met, so he accepted the invitation. That week, Lee became aware that a fellow believer urgently needed money. He wanted to help, but knew that he still didn't have the fare for his trip. However, Lee couldn't get this brother's plight out of his mind. God seemed to be reminding him. So the day before his departure, Lee gave the man $20. On Friday, the young minister crossed by ferry to the boat dock with only $10 in his pocket. No one as yet had sent him any money for expenses. On the ferry, Nee prayed earnestly, Lord, I'm not asking you for money, only to be taken to O. Arriving at the landing stage, Nee was accosted by the owner of a small steam launch. Are you going to Yanping or Chen O? the man asked. To Chen O? And he replied, then come with me, I'll take you. For how much? Seven dollars. Lee could hardly believe it. As he carried his baggage on board, he learned that the boat was under county charter, but the owner sometimes had one extra seat available, which he could let out to a passenger for a few extra dollars. Well, Lee enjoyed a peaceful, scenic trip up river to Xien O. For two weeks he preached in the town and had an impact on many, many people. At the end of the meetings, he faced the long boat ride back, now with only a dollar and twenty cents in his pocket. Other missionaries in Chen O were more than willing to help, but Ni told no one of his need. He'd been deeply impressed that God wanted to work in his own way. Before reaching the boat dock, the young preacher was overtaken by a messenger bearing a gift from one of his friends. This proved to be more than enough to cover his expenses, especially because the same charter boat happened to be there at the dock with the same vacant seat available. Watchman Nee would remember that trip to Shen O for the rest of his life. He had given much, he had received even more, but it wasn't the financial returns that Nee treasured, it was the thrill of cooperating with God of seeing his hand in action. Our friend Nee did not give and acquire wealth. He gave and acquired a rich faith. He had the wonderful assurance that God would meet his needs. There are two competing philosophies that face you and me every day. One says, grab all you can get. The other says, excel in the grace of giving. One promises material abundance and urges us to possess more and more. The other offers the riches of God's gracious giving and urges us to experience Him more and more. The religion of get never quite gets enough. But the way of giving is always filled. So how can we ensure that we don't fall into the getting trap? How do we make genuine giving a priority in our lives? Well, the Hebrews show us an excellent way of doing just that. They had a custom of dedicating the first of everything to the Lord. Firstborn child, first fruits of the harvest, the first of their flocks and herds. 
This became known as a tithe and was part of the Mosaic law. Leviticus says in the 30th verse of the 27th chapter, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Tithe is a word meaning a tenth. God's people were giving a tenth of their material gains back to God. The key point is that this was taken off the top. It was the first thing to be set aside at harvest time. The tithe was not to be leftovers given to God. It was not a reminder. Uh, it was the first, the best. Giving a tenth of what we earn back to God puts our possessions in the right perspective. They are only a means to an end. The tithe is a flag we raise over all our, that we get. It reminds us that everything belongs to God, that everything is to be used for His glory. The tithe is the starting point of all of our giving, and it helps us to give consistently. The Apostle Paul in his letters often reminds us of the blessings of systematic giving while encouraging the Corinthians to make a generous contribution for needy Macedonian believers, he said in 2 Corinthians 9th chapter, in the 6th verse, he said, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. I've found that to be true, haven't you? The tithe is a means for us to sow generously on a regular basis. It may seem to involve risk, but I've found that systematic giving brings some of the most satisfying adventures in life. I'll never forget the year going through college with a wife and baby son when we faced serious budget problems. Things were tight, but we never failed to return to God an honest tithe. One day my wife confided that she was wearing her last pair of hose, and I had to tell her that we were down to our last dollar. All we could do at that moment was pray about it. But the next morning, in the mailbox, there was a package containing three pairs of hosiery. And you know, we couldn't figure out who sent them. But sometime later up in Canada, someone walked up to me after a meeting and said, I'm the one who sent that package. I felt impressed that it was needed. Wonderful. It may have been a little thing, but through the years, I've seen so many ways in which God helps us reap generously. Tithing has been a wonderful faith-building experience in my life. I'd hate for anyone to miss out on it. So I'd like to invite you to enter into a partnership with God. Begin your own faith venture in tithing. Drop out of the religion of get. Experience the blessing of systematic giving. I, be I believe you'll acquire a, a rich faith. You'll experience spiritual abundance. God will supply all your needs. Shall we pray? Father mine, thank you for being so generous with us. Thank you for the security we have in your promises. Help us now to be generous with you. Please help us to excel in the grace of giving. We don't want to be trapped by the religion of get. We want to invest our resources and our lives in your service with no strings attached. Thank you for receiving and blessing our gifts. In the Savior's name, amen. Hello, I'm Lonnie Melashenko. Today's message helps us sort out our priorities, doesn't it? And here's good news. Pastor Vandeman has prepared a much-needed new book that takes a fresh look at some of these practical components of active Christianity. You will surely want a copy of this book, Blood Relative. Inspiring insights you can really use every day. Just write to us today or call the number that will appear on your screen and we'll send your free copy of Blood Relative by Pastor Vandeman right away. Now here is the information you need. As a convenience, you may request the free gift offer by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-253-3000. Call right now, that's 1-800-253-3000. Remember, the offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. 
You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the offer you want. Call toll-free now, 1-800-253-3000. Lines are open now. That's 1-800-253-3000. If you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. It has been said that we can never get ahead of the Lord in our giving. The more we give to Him, the more He gives to us. Today on Prayer Alert, we will see this principle in action in the life of a very successful Christian businessman from the South Pacific, the island of Fiji. Sitting with me here is Mr. Jim Akoy, who is also a member of Parliament in Fiji. Jim, we welcome you to What Is Written Today. Thank you, William. Thank you. Jim, I understand you were just getting into business. What kind of business? Well, we started off with uh, uh, the business systems division, uh, business, like selling computers and typewriters and photocopiers. But then it just exploded, and I sincerely believe it's a result of my tithing. How did it explode? What are you all well, into now? We're in uh, construction, we're in uh, real estate, we're in uh, uh, consumer products, we're in industrial products, and uh, we're in many other subsidiary companies in which we hold uh, uh, 50 to 51 percent of the stock of companies. My. So the Lord really has uh, richly blessed you as a result of putting him first. Yes, not only that, I, I serve on, at one time, about f on 55 company boards and statutory boards back home. Right. Mm -hmm. And last year, we also were responsible for building 19 churches 19 throughout churches. Fiji. 19 churches, my, that's wonderful. And well, I we funded it 50%. 50%, and then you challenge others to give as well. I might just say that Jim is also responsible for, it is written, uh, reaching many people's hearts through a video cassette on the island of Fiji. And we want to thank you for being on our program today. We want to challenge those of you who are watching as well to write with how the Lord is blessing in your life. I know this will be an encouragement to us. And for those of you that are waiting to put God to the test, give Him a chance, and He will as a result of faith and prayer. Write to us this week and let us know uh, your own prayer requests as well. And when you write, remember to ask for Pastor Vandeman's book entitled Unlocking Heaven's Storehouse. Write to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. And now back to George. And now the time has come to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.